introduction because the uh, live stream is not running yet. And it's great to see you and I just have a couple of technical housekeeping items. Um, you're probably aware with them anyway, but I'll just repeat them for now. Please uh, put your cell phones uh, into uh, silent mode or turn them off altogether. And we also have interpretation for you today. That means that if you want to listen to any one of the presentations or the panels in another language, you can just use the um, headsets um, at the back. And I would like to encourage you that you know, after any uh, of the presentations, if you really enjoyed it, I mean, give them a round of applause. That is certainly something that uh, the live stream will appreciate because I uh, know that you're actually here in the audience. And um, again, please use the microphones that we have available here for you, uh, the hand microphones to make sure that the interpreters can hear you as well and that you will then be uh, translated into uh, French or English or German and please introduce yourself as well. Now if you have to leave us for a moment please make sure that you use the doors at the back to make sure that you, you know, don't cross the uh, path of our uh, cameras that we've put up. So that's it and we'll launch into our event today in uh, a few moments. Ja, sehr herzlich willkommen, meine Damen und Herren, und zum fünften und damit schon traditionellen deutsch-französischen um, Energieforum hier Energy in Berlin. Ich freue mich sehr, Sie hier im Saal zu begrüßen und natürlich auch an den Bildschirmen. Und, online -Publikum. und ich finde, was könnte dringlicher sein als eben über die aktuelle Energiekrise, die Klimaziele und Lösungen, die wir finden müssen, heute zu sprechen. Und ich verspreche Ihnen wirklich ein spannenden Austausch we'll be mit about that sehr today. vielen, and, um, sehr interessanten Expertinnen und Experten. Mein Name ist Jean uh, Hubner, ich bin uh, Vizepräsidentin uh, Kommunikation uh, an der Technischen uh, Universität uh, München uh, und uh, Wissenschaftsjournalistin uh, und freue mich, uh, Sie heute durch well. diese wir haben jetzt eine Begrüßungsrunde Now, und äh, ich heiße sehr herzlich willkommen Stefan Wenzel, Parlamentarischer um, Staatssekretär Wenzel, um, beim Bundesminister für Wirtschaft und Klima. Herr Wenzel, darf ich Sie bitte aufs Podium bitten. Herzlich willkommen. Herzlichen Dank für die Einführung in unsere Veranstaltung. Sehr geehrter Herr Botschafter Delatre, 
Sehr geehrter Herr Markus Hicken, Beauftragter für Energie, Außenpolitik, Klima und Sicherheit. Sehr geehrter Herr Rösner, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren hier in der Aula des Bundesministeriums, des BMWK und auch online zugeschaltet. Ich freue mich Energieforum, dass der neue französische Botschafter hier bei der Wiedervereinigung in Deutschland been in äh, Germany um, during a German reunification he's been äh, at the uh, French embassy back die then and an diese Zeit and, uh, you know uh, uh, die deutsch französische about, uh, zusammenarbeit the, uh, Zusammen, I think, especially weil uns in dieser these, Zeit auch sehr times, große Unterstützung uh, von Deutsch close, close partners, zugewachsen ist. Uh, back then, uh, das deutsche uh, Format ist uh, ein point. etabliertes this Format. Das Franco-German ja. uh, Form, das ist uh, ein established uh, Form von Kooperation. Und wir haben dieses Form hier für den ersten Mal gehostet vom Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action. Im Ministerium uh, de la Transition in uh, der Zeit. Meetings uh, in uh, Paris, uh, the Ministry of um, Ecological uh, Transition, uh, amongst uh, other uh, issues, and um, that was a fantastic event as well. Now, this year we are also looking forward to fantastic speakers, and Mr. Ambassador uh, Lettre, Mr. Hicken, that you're joining us um, here today is fantastic as well, and we'll hear from you in your course as well. I would also like um, to thank uh, our partners um, for this fantastic um, uh, cooperation. I mean, it's a challenging year. The uh, uh, Russian war uh, of aggression on Ukraine has uh, fundamentally changed the landscape. Um, and the 8th of March, um, about two weeks um, after Russia attacked Ukraine, uh, the European uh, heads um, of state and government have met in Versailles, close to Paris, and um, they have um, launched the Repower, Repower uh, EU, a plan which um, targeted um, EU energy sovereignty, wanted to strengthen that, uh, wanted to strengthen energy efficiency and reduce the uh, dependencies um, on fossil fuels uh, to push renewables. That was, uh, I think, an important milestone uh, for us. We can now see uh, that this um, starts to, to bear fruit. Um, we see uh, bilateral uh, agreements. Um, uh, the uh, Vice um, Commissioner Timmermans, um, he uh, actually um, appeals to set us more ambitious uh, climate goals um, in Sharm el Sheikh, um, and uh, he uh, based all of that on our efforts that we launched in Versailles. Uh, also, the cooperation in terms of uh, gas supplies, gas deliveries um, is um, extremely helpful in these uh, difficult times and strengthens both of our countries. On uh, at a site um, event uh, in, in Egypt at the COP27, um, the uh, climate conference, um, France um, was joined by Portugal and Spain and Morocco uh, and um, passed uh, a memorandum of understanding uh, laying out how uh, energy deliveries um, between Africa and um, Southern Europe and Central Europe could be strengthened, um, particularly uh, looking at renewables. Now, that's just three examples um, of a very diverse and comprehensive um, cooperation and communication that um, is happening not just this year, but um, that is happening this year with the particular challenges as a backdrop and um, with uh, the uh, Energy uh, Council meetings as a backdrop as well. You will certainly agree that it's a success that um, we are now having regular Energy Forum events um, every year and that this has uh, been a recurring event um, in the Franco-German cooperation. And this is um, very much thanks to you. Mr. Rösner and your team um, at the uh, OVTE and all the colleagues, uh, and a lot of uh, those colleagues are joining us here today and um, were very involved in setting the agenda. 
and um, it is um, very unfortunate, of course, um, that I won't be able to uh, uh, stay here with you um, all day. I would also like to um, thank um, Ms. Um, Conti, who has been uh, with us um, as part of the Energy Forum right off the bat. Now, um, OFATE is um, a great project um, that um, is uh, was launched um, by um, our ministry here and um, by the uh, MTE together, and that is uh, a great forum for all the stakeholders um, uh, in the uh, energy transition. They very much appreciate this opportunity, and there are a lot of legal questions, technical questions, uh, a lot of um, information to be shared between uh, our two countries, which I think is a great um, foundation uh, for cooperation, to, to know about one another, to know know about one's uh, strengths and weaknesses to support one another. That, I think, is uh, very important in uh, Franco-German relations. And I think this view is also shared by Minister Habeck, who unfortunately can't be with us here today. Our event uh, today is uh, an event in a, in a series of um, high-ranking Franco-German events. Uh, Mr. Habeck traveled to Paris earlier this week uh, to talk um, to uh, President Macron, um, to uh, uh, Minister Panier, and um, to uh, Minister Le Maire uh, about uh, these issues. And uh, tomorrow, the French uh, Prime Minister uh, Bourne is uh, going to uh, be traveling to Berlin to meet um, Chancellor Scholz and Minister Habeck. And, um, Minister Pani Rumacher is going to join her. Unfortunately, um, the minister is not going to be with us today, but I still think uh, we're in for a great event today. And our event um, very much completes this Franco-German week uh, of cooperation. And I'm also very much um, uh, looking forward uh, to our dialogue um, and panel discussion this um, afternoon uh, um, with uh, Mr. Laurent. Um, and uh, I think everything on the agenda is, is going to be are pretty interesting. So, in times like um, these, uh, uh, geopolitical questions um, are uh, all the more important, but climate change is at the very center of our attention, not just because of um, Sharm el Sheikh. Um, there were other challenges um, to overcome this uh, summer. Amongst other things, um, the uh, Rhine River that had uh, uh, almost uh, uh, dried up this summer, the Loire um, in France. Uh, Po in Italy, the Yangtze in uh, China, in California, uh, they were also uh, challenged by an extreme uh, drought uh, that was very challenging for water supplies. So this is a very global issue, similar developments um, that also have uh, massive uh, economic uh, consequences. So we were looking at ways to uh, transport goods to our um, factories, to uh, our power plants, if we can't use uh, inland rivers for that transport, uh, because we, for example, can't use the Rhine River. So I think it goes to show how serious we have to take um, these uh, developments and their impact that they're having uh, today. So we'll be today uh, discussing how we can speed up the uh, transition towards renewable energies and how we can actually achieve our climate targets. The uh, Paris agreement and the targets that have been set back then, uh, something that um, all countries uh, signed worldwide, and we as European Union supported as well. And we are committed to achieving these uh, targets, and we've uh, closely cooperated with our partners uh, in uh, Sharm el Sheikh. Um, we've uh, worked closely with um, our uh, European uh, neighbors, and that was a driver, that was uh, an important component uh, in Sharm el Sheikh that we were able to really move in the same direction here with our European partners. So we are expecting us to meet the challenge and also to overcome the challenges that are posed by um, the Russian war of um, aggression on Ukraine, looking for new energy partners um, and um, becoming more independent of past dependencies. And we'll also be looking at the role that um, Germany and France and our cooperation uh, will be playing in this context. So we are looking for answers today and uh, we will be able to go uh, in uh, more detail on these issues together. So I'm very much looking forward to an exciting event today. I hope you'll enjoy the event. I think it is uh, a very timely event today. Thank you so much.
Ja, vielen Dank, Herr Staatssekretär. Thank you so much, um, State Secretary Vanzel. And now I would like uh, to ask uh, François Delotre, French Ambassador to Germany, to join me on the stage. The floor is yours. Bonjour, mes chers amis. Sehr geehrter Herr uh, Parlamentarischer Staatssekretär Wenzel, sehr geehrter Herr Markus Icken, Beauftragter für Energie, Außenpolitik, Klima und Sicherheit, sehr geehrter Herr Direktor Herr Rössner, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, mes chers amis, als der neue französische Botschafter in Deutschland, es ist eine große Freude, heute Morgen mit Ihnen zu sein. Und ich danke Ihnen sehr herzlich für die Einladung zu dieser Veranstaltung, die sich mit den Klimazielen der Europäischen Union in den kommenden Jahren At, um, the uh, EU climate goals and climate action in the coming years. And I'm uh, delighted that um, the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action uh, in Germany and the Foreign Office in Germany and, of course, the German government uh, is uh, represented here uh, today at a very high level. Uh, State Secretary uh, Wenzel and Mr. Eken, thank you so much. Now, your participation uh, today at this Franco German event, I think, is uh, an important and well appreciated uh, uh, sign uh, and symbol. And I would also like uh, to thank uh, Mr. Rösner, Director uh, Energiewende. Es ist ihm gelungen, zahlreiche europäische Expertinnen und Experten zusammen zu gerufen, um Ihnen, meine Damen und Herren, einen wertvollen Einblick in den Stand der Forschung und Entwicklung im Energiebereich zu bieten. Si vous me permettez de poursuivre en français, ce rendez-vous, comme vous l'avez souligné, Monsieur le Secrétaire d'État, franco-allemand vient à point nommé aujourd'hui dans un nouveau cadre international que vous avez fort bien décrit. C'est un événement juste à la bonne point en temps, parce que nous avons expérimenté un challenge en temps. La Russie utilise l'énergie comme une arme, et c'est dans le temps que nous ascertain l'énergie, la sécurité et l'indépendance comme l'Union européenne. Donc, comme vous l'avez dit, nous devons réduire les dépendances sur le gaz russien et le gaz russien. Uh, due to this war that is happening on the European continent. We have achieved this goal in order to safeguard um, our um, prosperity and our safety. So we have to push the energy uh, transition forward. Furthermore, we have to further diversify our energy mix. Uh, we have to tap into uh, new uh, renewable energies. And we know that this will help us uh, in our uh, efforts uh, and will help us decarbonize the energy sector and decarbonize our economies. In Germany and in France, we have uh, this joint uh, target that we're aiming for. And when we take a long-term view, we want to achieve decarbonization. We have to uh, switch to hydrogen, for example, decarbonized sources of energy in order to uh, better um, position ourselves in terms of energy supplies. Dans de nouvelles dépendances, ce qui ne ferait qu'alimenter. We also have to make sure that we do not actually end up with new dependencies in this effort, et qui occupe une large place dans le débat public de part et d'autre du Rhin. L'accompagnement des acteurs économiques et des ménages les plus fragiles. Le débat est en cours en Allemagne, en France, et heureusement, nous comprenons and supporting private households, something that we do in France and in Germany. We are constantly in a dialogue to support private households that are less well off. We have to help them to manage. Uh, and to make ends meet um, during this energy transition. And um, I think we have an um, important role to play here um, in order to find a way for this to, to be a success and to make sure that um, we remain competitive and that uh, the level playing field is not tipped in. 
au Conseil de l'énergie qui se tient aujourd'hui même et qui portera notamment sur des mesures pour limiter les prix du gaz afin d'aider les ménages et les entreprises. Malgré, je dirais, la situation exceptionnelle à laquelle nous sommes confrontés, nous devons, je crois, rester concentrés en franco-allemand sur les objectifs de l'Union qui témoignent d'une ambition climatique. CO2 market socialement la transition énergétique by uh, 2030 and we want to uh, achieve this uh, transition uh, to um, renewables um, by supporting um, our countries with uh, 59 uh, million euros um, over the course of those years. We've also uh, agreed um, to uh, pass um, legislation that is going to avoid carbon leakage uh, between countries. And as you said, Mr. Wenzel, the European Union, with the support of France and Germany, is going to lead the way in order to uh, move decarbonization forward in a challenging international context. We've witnessed um, these developments at COP27. Um, the results were you know, a bit of a mixed bag because we've seen that industrialized countries uh, agreed to and have to support um, emerging economies and, and those countries that are most affected by climate change. We have to do everything that we can to work together and um, to looking at the uh, special fund um, for uh, poorer countries um, to uh, you know, actually make that happen and provide the funds necessary. I would also like to use the opportunity today to share with you uh, a message of trust uh, because uh, the uh, Franco-German partnership is fantastic and um, uh, the uh, meeting on uh, the 26th of uh, October uh, between uh, Chancellor La Scholz um, and uh, President Macron, that I was part of as well, was an important step uh, along those lines. And now it is very much uh, about you know, getting the uh, uh, Franco-German motor, get this drive uh, going again. And this week um, uh, sees a lot of Franco-German uh, meetings, uh, a lot of Franco-German talks. Du vice chancelier Robert Habeck et du ministre Christian Lindner. Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock traveled to Paris. Christian Lindner, Minister Lindner, traveled to Paris as well. And la visite demain the uh, de notre premier Cultural ministre, Affairs, uh, French Minister of Cultural Affairs, is going to travel to uh, Berlin. Um, Berlin. Um, Elizabeth Bourne, uh, Minister Bourne, is going to travel to Berlin as well as we've heard in order to uh, enter into a dialogue with the German Chancellor and with uh, Minister Habeck. That, I think, is, is quite the agenda that they've um, set. Uh, Mr. Habeck, the German Vice uh, Chancellor, and uh, Bruno Le Maire, French uh, Minister for Economic Affairs have announced in recent days that um, in the uh, context of their recent meeting that they want to strengthen Franco-German cooperation, in particular um, in a, a lot of technological um, issues um, and uh, energy political issues, and so they want to cooperate more closely, especially when it comes to hydrogen. And they are currently working uh, on an agreement of solidarity uh, between uh, Germany and France uh, in order to uh, support um, better gas supplies going forward to make sure that uh, energy supplies for both countries are secured. So as you can see, things are making progress and this is very much happening in the spirit of our friendship. We've done everything um, that we can in our respective countries to make sure that our experts can work together also in the spirit of um, Franco-German friendship. Despite the fact that there might be different uh, opinions, different priorities, I think there is a shared 
conviction of um, our friendship and willingness uh, to compromise uh, in France and in Germany. There are so many partnerships uh, between our two countries. There are new partnerships being entered into, which all goes to show that uh, we have a strong uh, relation, uh, especially um, with um, uh, our goal of fighting climate change. And uh, whether we do this uh, in uh, terms of um, you know, working in the energy sector or working on fighting climate change in the energy transition, we are closely cooperating. And I would like to thank everyone involved um, uh, in the event um, uh, today as uh, um, you know, employees at the OFATE and everyone here really working uh, on the sidelines of these events. And thank you so much to the interpreters as well um, for making this event possible today and allowing us to continue our uh, dialogue and uh, really really uh, living up to uh, this uh, spirit of friendship that I've uh, mentioned. Um, thank you so much uh, as well to my colleagues at the uh, French Embassy, and thank you so much to um, the um, head of um, the uh, department there at the Embassy that is with us here today. And our uh, forum here, the Energy Forum, is a German forum, a French uh, forum that allows us to bring all the stakeholders together from uh, businesses uh, to researchers and scientists. Everyone uh, is uh, involved here, and I would like to thank everyone uh, that is um, you know, participating. Thank you so much for your commitment, um, and I can assure you that this uh, is going to be um, you know, a fruitful uh, set of discussions today, and that is uh, going to be very much part of um, the agenda going forward. Thank you so much. Yeah, merci beaucoup. Vielen Dank, Herr Botschafter de Latre, for your words and this bekenntnis. Then for your you message and your presentation. I am delighted to see Marcus Hitton here today, who is Director for Energy Diplomacy, Climate and Security at the German Federal Foreign Office. Welcome. You've got, you have the floor. Mr. Ambassador, State Secretary, Mr. Rössler, meine Damen Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Foreign Ministry to this year's uh, Franco-German Energy Forum. Its title this year is EU Energy and Climate Goals for 2030. What roadmap is necessary for energy transition? And today's presentations will demonstrate why the Franco-German Office for the Energy Transition has chosen this title for today's event. What kind of roadmap do we need? Because many things are uncertain in these turbulent times, and this is also true for energy policy. A very important raison d'être for the Franco-German Office for the Energy Transition and for this forum is that decision makers from France and from Germany meet here in order to jointly promote energy transition and to promote bilateral cooperation between Germany and France for the next decades. And therefore, I think that this forum this year comes very timely, because the Franco-German ministerial councils, because discussions on energy topics in Brussels have been postponed and put into a different format, many had the impression that uh, Franco-German cooperation on energy topics uh, could uh, do better, and we in the Foreign Office would be very happy if you, dear participants, could see the value of our cooperation between our two countries. If you begin to better understand the point of view of your counterparts, and if you can take some ideas and create new and productive contexts. For Germany, energy security and energy transition and climate action go hand in hand. And we must not allow that these topics play against each other. 
These topics are interconnected. A quick energy transition is not only elementary for our security of supply and for the independence of Europe, it is also a very important part Plays very, and plays a very important role in order to achieve um, Parisian climate goals. Many observers have seen the abominable war of aggression of Russia against Ukraine and have concluded that this will be the revival of fossil fuels. But my impression is that the contrary is true. Of course, we had to very quickly become independent and stop importing Russian gas and Russian energy sources. This means that we need to diversify our countries. It also means that we need to accelerate energy transition and to prioritize efficiency measures. Because of this war, we decided to use the so-called dirty energies for short term in Germany. This means coal. But at the end of the day, we will drastically accelerate the energy transition in Germany, in France and in the European Union as a whole. The fact that we were able to become independent within a couple of months from Russian energy supplies was only due to our great cooperation, through, thanks to the great coordination of our measures, and State Secretary and uh, Mr. Ambassador have already mentioned that. But I would also like to stress the following. European solidarity does not only live in Brussels. France and Germany, as you have correctly said, have also started uh, to explore new ways uh, to um, work in solidarity. Germany will in future deliver uh, electricity to France and uh, for both sides investments and uh, uh, investments were very important and this was a great sign of how solidarity can work. The Russian war of aggression and its consequences have resulted in an energy crisis and in higher prices for fossil fuels. For months we have thought about how to solve this crisis in Brussels and in consultations between Paris and Berlin. We were looking for uh, solutions in order to counteract the social and economic um, the problems that have resulted from this crisis. And we have already achieved a lot. Therefore, we should not only speak about a price cap for ga uh, gas in this context. I would quite on the contrary wish that you, dear participants and all actors of uh, the Franco-German Energy Cooperation, explore all the fields in order but we should always stress the positive sides of uh, our situation and what we have achieved. I would like to take the opportunity and thank all participants and all speakers for their commitment to this forum. I wish you all interesting presentations and discussions and would like to thank the Franco-German Office for the Energy Transition, of course also the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action, the French Ministry for Energy Transition and my colleagues in the Foreign Office for organizing this forum. Merci bien. Thank you very much. Yeah, vielen Dank, Herr Hicken. Thank you very much, Mr. Hicken, for your welcoming address. And last but not least, I would like to welcome the director of the Franco-German Office for the Energy Transition, Mr. Sven Rösner. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Monsieur l'Ambassadeur, Mr. Ambassador, Wenzel, State Secretary Wenzel, Hicken, Mesdames et Messieurs, chers collègues, chers amis, Mr. Hicken, bonjour et bienvenue au nom de l'Office uh, pour la transition énergétique à ce cinquième forum franco-allemand de l'énergie. C'est pour nous, comme toujours, un grand honneur de pouvoir figurer aujourd'hui 
avec le ministère fédéral de l'économie et de climat, le ministère de la transition énergétique uh, et le ministère fédéral des affaires étrangères parmi les co-organisateurs de ce rendez-vous. Nous nous retrouvons aujourd'hui peu après la conclusion des négociations de Sharm el Sheikh, nous venons l'entendre, lors de la COP27 qui semble confirmer la trajectoire de 1,8 degré de Glasgow. Mais nous nous retrouvons aussi après une année mouvementée pour le secteur de l'énergie en Europe et dans le monde. Si les années du Covid nous ont confrontés à une baisse fulgurante de la charge, les tendances se sont inversées depuis. Nous avons assisté à une situation de l'invasion de l'Ukraine par la Russie. En effet, si nous It is true that if we look at uh, the triangle of uh, energy uh, policy today with its three summits, security of supply, sustainable development and geography, then we understand that we need to be more clear in our goals. This year, 2022, has resulted in higher prices and in Europe. Nous avons souvent espéré que les citoyens la question de l'énergie. We hoped for a long time that our citizens uh, will deal with uh, the questions of energy uh, and now they have to due to increased prices and uh, these uh, price increases may be, and this is may, may be the only positive aspect of uh, price increases this year. Ladies and gentlemen, this may be a bit of a sad uh, conclusion of, of this year, but um, We had already we heard last year, for instance, that Russia is a reliable partner on an international level, and this partner wanted to become a green energy giant. And then, only a couple of months later, uh, we had we saw that we had to find other path. Um, for uh, our energy supplies, and this will be the case for the coming years. This uh, trap into which we walked uh, reminds us of uh, a uh, crisis of Goethe's Faust, uh, who said that at the beginning it was not, uh, there was not the word, but maybe the spirit uh, that existed in the beginning. And this uh, year, 2022, will be truly remembered as a historic year, as the year in which we became aware of uh, uh, current energy questions. But um, we see that this political crisis, where everything is distorted, if you will, mais aussi aussi au niveau national avec pour la France une loi sur l'accélération Brussels but also at uh, the law in to accelerate renewable energies or the uh, law for energy efficiencies or in Germany for instance Um, if you look at uh, the coalition agreements and uh, the laws, all of it is starting to move, is getting movement ahead, and all of this due to political pressure. Oftentimes, we have to make very painful compromises, but in order to be efficient, we also have to make another conclusion. Et c'est par nos actions At the beginning, que nous allons être jugés. Nous, there was the deed, and it's only by our deeds that we will be judged at the end of the day. Private actors, scientists, and everybody will be judged by their actions because uh, great goals are useless if they do not serve, if, if they're not implemented. And, um, We must use the potential in our society. We must use this potential in order to serve our economy and our citizens.
This is why we look forward, forward to our discussions of today. We look forward to the actions of all the actors of uh, the energy transition, and we want to contribute to implementing these um, goals, uh, not only by words, but above all through actions and through deeds. We have passed the stage to convince the people of the necessity de réinventer le feu. Aujourd'hui, nous devons travailler ensemble pour inventer ce nouveau feu. To organize this event and to making it a success, I wish you all a very interesting uh, day and a constructive day. Thank you very much. Ja, ganz herzlichen Dank, Herr Rösner, für diese Einleitung much, in Rösner, unsere Tagung. To our event today. And so we can start with our first part of uh, our um, content. And the title is The Deci Decisive Decade How Does Europe Achieve Its Energy and Climate Goals for 2030? And I'm delighted to see many experts here today. The first one to present. Uh, his topic is uh, Dr. Andreas Lösche, who will speak about the role of energy in long-term climate change mitigation. He is Chair of Environmental and Research Economics and Sustainability at Roy University in Bochum. Since 2011, he is also Chair of the Expert Commission on Monitoring the energy of uh, the future for the federal government. Therefore, he has a great overview of the energy transition. He is also one of the authors of uh, the fifth and sixth IPCC expert report. Welcome, Mr. Lesher. Thank you very much. Ambassador de Latre. Mr. Wenzel, Mr. Wenzel, Mr. Hicken and Mr. Rösner, I have the opportunity today to speak about the role of energy in long-term climate change mitigation. And I can start by saying it plays a, an enormous role. It is part of the problem, but it must also be an important part of the solution and uh, the title for this uh, panel is the decisive decade and this of course is 100 percent true and i would like to briefly talk about this we just uh, looked at uh, when uh, preparing the last ipcc report uh, how do how are we uh, coming along achieving uh, Parisian climate goals? How does it go in hand with all sorts of developments on the international level? And since I'm the first one to speak today, I would like to start globally, if you will, and uh, look at the different uh, components of our six uh, report that was published this year. And uh, I personally had the opportunity to write uh, a chapter on energy systems. As I've already said, energy systems are crucial in this. And here we will have a look at how emissions have changed over the last decade. You see here that they have risen constantly between 1990 and 2020. You can also see that Europe takes a very small part in these emissions, but other regions uh, are rising on the charts. And on the right-hand side of this chart, you see that um, in total, North America is responsible for the biggest part of emissions, but then also followed by Europe, and we also um, see Asia and China who also are responsible for great parts of the emissions. And if you look at the per capita emissions, then you see that uh, Europe is only in the middle and is uh, 
surpassed by North America, Australia, Eastern Europe, and so on and so forth. So um, their emissions are much, much higher than uh, in our region in Europe. The role of energy for these emissions, as I've said, is, is very large. One third of CO2 emissions come from uh, the energy sectors, about one quarter from industry and uh, from uh, agriculture. It's about one six. six Per, sex, uh, per sector, and uh, before um, you add indirect uh, emissions, uh, you look at industry, of course, uh, this is about one third of all emissions, and the housing sector, of course, also plays an important role. Now, what, our, what are our long-term goals? We looked at this report and we asked ourselves, what are emission paths that would be compatible with our goal of 1.5 and 2 percent? In my working group, we looked at exactly this uh, chart and uh, then looked at our um, Parisian uh, climate change goals. So, if we want to achieve uh, the two-goal target, then by 2070, we need to achieve a net zero CO2 emission level. And uh, we, at, at that time, we didn't look at a scenario of 1.5. That was in 2012 when we uh, wrote our last report and uh, the IPC, as you know, does not uh, work out scenarios. It only um, combines everything that it reads in different uh, publications. Uh, so at that time, we didn't look at the scenario of 1.5 degrees Celsius. That came much later. We had a special report that followed with this target 1.5, and this new IPC report actually does include this scenario of 1.5 degrees. What does it actually mean in practice, and what in, in, with over 50 percent uh, probability we need to achieve the net zero? by 2050 already. And this is the reason why Germany is now uh, targeting the year 2045, because given all these scenarios, uh, we, of course, need to accelerate our actions. Now, the question is, what will the next decade be like? The next decade is, of course, always very decisive when looking at these scenarios. If you look at this in green and in blue, these are the uh, scenarios with uh, two degrees Celsius. And if you want to go below, you will you will see that the lines will will go down, will decline. And you know that each emitted ton obviously changes the climate. It stays in the atmosphere for a really long time and uh, causes uh, temperature increases. This is why we introduced this idea of CO2 budgets that they're only allowed to emit a certain amount of CO2 volumes in order to reach these uh, targets. We speak about 510 uh, gigatons for 1.5 grid and about 180 in order to achieve 2 degrees Celsius. But of course, we need to achieve this decline very, very quickly. It is correct to say that the next decade is extremely decisive, but in these scenarios, we always uh, thought that we will uh, manage to uh, reduce the amounts by 50 percent. And it is extremely difficult to, to imagine this, to see that we see this in, in Germany when we look at the emission numbers for this year. It, it really is a decisive scenario. If we do not manage to achieve this reduction of 50 percent, then the CO2 budget that remains is so small that the one 
then we won't need to look at the 1.5 scenario uh, when writing the next uh, ICCC report. And even if we look at the 2, percent, uh, two, two degree scenario, we need to really act very quickly in order to achieve these reductions. What are the sectoral contributions for this, these reductions? If you look at this chart, you will see that energy is a very central component and the scenarios that are compatible with the 1.5 goal with the very small increases in temperature, then you see that the global use of coal and gas are reduced massively. Coal 95, by 95 percent, oil 65 percent, and 45 percent for gas as compared to uh, 2019 when we wrote the report. And even if we take the scenario of two degrees, 85 degrees uh, on coal, and over 20 percent of gas and 15 percent of uh, gas. When man here sich anschaut, dass wir auch Szenarien haben, wenn man sich anschaut, was wird gemacht mit ohne, also mit Kohle, Öl, Kohle, Öl und Gas ohne CCS. Ja, dann wird klar, das gibt es eigentlich gar nicht mehr. Also zumindest bei Kohle ne, wird das eigentlich nicht gemacht. Das sind, without, without these um, uh, targets, then you'll come to the conclusion then that it won't be um, possible anymore. So it, it, it won't be relevant anymore. In other sectors, it's uh, slightly different. Now when we look at um, energy here, there is um, a slight positive contribution, but, but also negative contribution at the bottom in terms of emissions, and that's um, by energy and um, using or uh, implementing a CCS, um, so by energy that uh, actually takes CO2 from the atmosphere via uh, photosynthesis, and uh, if we use that, then um, if it's um, you know being uh, used in the process, we use. Um, carbon uh, capture and, and uh, sequestration or storage, uh, we, we use that and store it instead of emitting it again. So that actually has a negative impact um, on emissions, um, reducing emissions um, further. And to a, a certain uh, level, we could also use direct air capture, but that really just um, at, at a smaller scale. So 75% of reductions uh, would uh, have to come from the energy sector, directly or uh, indirectly. And on the right-hand side, you can see in, in red the reductions contributed um, by the energy uh, sector, 75 percent, that is, in terms of energy supply and demand. And everything else is um, you know, forestry, um, agriculture, or non-CO2 emissions that would have to contribute. Um, so energy is, is very much at the center here in terms of reducing CO2 emissions, and uh, energy systems um, will have to fundamentally change. We took a look at what this uh, might mean. We uh, put a couple of examples uh, in uh, our report on how energy flows are going to change globally. We'll hear more about this in, in the course of the event today, but the system has to, as I said, fundamentally change. Um, currently, it is a very much fossil fuel dominated system and has to be changed to a renewables uh, based system. And that mainly uh, acts as uh, a system that electrifies uh, resources. And then we have some indirect um, electrification by, um, by hydrogen uh, as well. And that means we have a much higher efficiency in terms of energy supplies. If we you know, take a look at the, the contributors here in the energy sector, then you'll note that uh, coal, oil and gas are currently uh, playing an important role and coal is uh, playing an important role in terms of emissions. So the focus um, is on coal and it should be uh, if we want to achieve our climate um, targets because that is going to be uh, the uh, lowest hanging fruit so to say to tackle 
um, and everything else I mean, is, is a bit more challenging. So again, uh, coal is easiest um, to, um, to tackle. And in these scenarios, um, you can see that coal is um, currently the biggest um, contributor uh, to emissions when we look at the energy sector. So 45% um, of um, emissions in the energy sector are coal. So this is very central and plays an important role. Which is why, um, you know, when we look at the energy sector uh, generating energy, electricity, um, there we see that that is, is an important contributor and, and all in all it's, as I mentioned, one third of um, emissions. So we have to look at ways to phase out coal, which is of course, a very interesting challenge, but the gas crisis um, somewhat um, pushed this to the side because coal is an alternative or an option in this crisis. So I early on um, really appeal to stakeholders to look at ways to use more coal um, in the market instead of gas. But I think we still have to maintain that long-term target of phasing out coal. And that is why I also think it was important uh, that the German uh, government um, committed and recommitted to phasing out coal and that we um, really achieve this by 2030 in, in Germany, to really have phased out uh, coal by then, despite the fact that we're currently using a higher share of uh, coal in energy production. Now, we are, of course, very much committed and, and very close to the uh, Paris Climate Agreement and, and the targets there, but it's, it's a very much a, a global question. Um, so you can see here what the challenges um, are. These are a couple of examples at the top left. Um, you can see the uh, coal-fired uh, power plants that have been phased out. So in uh, the uh, 2010s, uh, so between 2010 and 2020, there was a lot uh, phased out. And the, the biggest phase out happened in the United States. Um, a lot of uh, older uh, power plants um, that were phased out, very old power plants that were uh, really shut down and replaced, and replaced by uh, gas power plants or renewables. But you can also see that there is a, a different um, chart uh, there in, in Asia, for example. Um, there were a lot of coal-fired power plants with low efficiencies that were phased out. Um, and in red, you can see the capacities that are still available. Uh, red in China, then you can see uh, India in, in orange. Um, that's uh, quite considerable capacities that are still available. And we have to really um, phase that out, um, as you can see in the top right. So this is an important uh, building block. So we need more renewables, but we also have to make sure that we phase out some um, uh, coal-fired power plants. And at the bottom, you can see what this phasing out should look like. In, in green and in blue, you can see um, the, the charts for 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees blue 1.5, green 2 degrees, and you can see here how this would have to work in order to achieve that. Also looking at the, the run times of those uh, power plants, I mean, they're not going to be uh, on grid for 70 years because they are going to be newer power plants, more efficient ones. So I think this is uh, going to have an impact there, shorter um, run times for those uh, power plants. And on the right hand side, what you can see is what would happen if we add at those power plants that are currently under construction. And that's not including those that are currently being planned or that still need approval. So looking at that, we have to really be uh, uh, aware that we shouldn't add too many power plants because that just makes it more difficult uh, in the future to achieve uh, our targets and to reduce emissions. So we need to phase out coal sooner if we look at uh, the, the math here, uh, we are looking at 10 to 20 years sooner um, to phase out those um, power plants. Um, if we compare the 1.5 degrees to, to 2 degrees, and if we want to achieve 1.5 degrees, it's, it's about 30 uh, years sooner um, in, uh, phase out. And the um, uh, German government um, has entered into a lot of energy partnerships um, with um, Africa, with Indonesia, 
with the, uh, with Vietnam, also uh, Vietnam uh, potentially happening soon. And they are important players in this context because they are currently planning a lot of new power plants. And if we lock that in, these new power plants, then we are not going to be able to meet our targets. And so I'm trying to, to wrap things up. Um, so what it is that, that we know about how to achieve this? What uh, are the solutions? So efficiency is going to be important. Expanding on renewables is going to be important. And what we did is take a look at how technology changed in the last 10 years. Um, especially looking at, at costs and uh, at uh, implementation or execution. So, of course, if you expand a technology, you reduce costs, um, so it's scalability. And you can see that when we look at photovoltaics at the top left, um, costs have really decreased um, considerably in the last 10 years. But not just um, for uh, solar, that's 85%. Um, lower costs, um, but we've also seen a, a huge reduction in uh, battery costs uh, in the last decade. And what you can see here the, in, in grey, um, the uh, average cost of, of uh, technology for fossil fuels as of 2019, uh, and you know you can you know, push that up a bit because it's going to be more expensive uh, today. The, the average cost uh, of, of these, uh, fossils, and you can see that from a com uh, competition point of view, um, these new uh, technologies are competitive, and you can see a trend in all of these uh, technologies, and there is investment in these technologies as well, and this very much reflects what you can see here on the chart. And what you can see in uh, the uh, cost reductions that we've seen, as of, as I mentioned, 2019. So if you take a look at the 2020 figures, um, costs for uh, alternative technologies would have come down even more. And when we look at uh, wind energy, solar energy, they are um, at, at the heart of um, uh, identifying uh, options for reducing CO2 emissions. So this is what we've gathered here uh, on uh, this chart. So how could we reduce emissions, um, both looking at costs and of the uh, overall um, amounts uh, to reduce this by? And there are a variety of, of conditions that have to be met, and sometimes it's not really a question anymore of um, financial feasibility or economics. It's rather a question of availability, whether this is possible or not. And even then, um, we've seen costs here close to zero or at zero, and um, very low threshold options here that we could tap into. So if you just look at uh, current gas, uh, coal or oil prices, and look at that in the context of CO2 prices, then these prices would be much higher than what we're seeing here on the chart. I mean, everything would be blue here. Costs um, are lower than the reference here in this uh, chart. And I think it's important uh, to set the right political framework um, for this as well, um, because, I mean, gas prices are potentially going to come down in the future, and CO2 prices, the regulatory framework, is going to take a more important, more prominent role. But this, I think, is uh, going to be vital for um, reductions. But in other sectors, when we look at housing, uh, buildings, transport, um, and in particular uh, in the uh, manufacturing industry uh, sectors there, it is more expensive, it is more difficult to achieve. So that means that the energy sector is in, in all our scenarios um, is, is the first one that uh, actually achieves um, CO2 zero or um, CO2 uh, neutrality and the other sectors are going to uh, follow uh, later. So we have to create the framework for this reduction to actually take place. And 
we need these um, options and the options for reduction that's, uh, that we can see here, they are not um, necessarily uh, ready and available on the market at the price that they um, should have or need to have in, in order to make them feasible. And you also need the right infrastructure. So we can't really launch this on the market without having the infrastructure. So if we don't have hydrogen pipelines, if we don't have charging stations, and if the electricity grid is actually not up to the task, then this is not feasible. So we have to really uh, be aware of that different sectors will uh, contribute differently at different uh, time frames, but we have to really lay the foundations for this to happen in the future. But when we look at the energy sector, uh, energy generation, electricity generation, that is um, the uh, sector that is going to lead uh, the way. And um, now this is my French uh, week as, as well. So this just as an aside here, um, we are going to have a discussion with uh, Emmanuel Macron this uh, afternoon, the president um, of um, the uh, French um, uh, Energy Agency. And we'll be talking about market design, uh, mainly um, how energy markets are going to change, which I think is, is a very uh, interesting uh, topic. And this afternoon, we'll have uh, a presentation about that as well. So this is going to be very uh, exciting and we will uh, be starting early next year um, with a uh, potentially with um, you know working on a platform for energy market design uh, the German government is um, uh, very much in favor of um, developing something like this and I think that is something that we'll have to to tackle uh, in due course um, and with that I'd uh, like to wrap it up thank you so much for your attention Ja, ganz herzlichen Dank, Herr Professor Löschel, für diesen Einstieg und äh, sagen auch die eindrücklichen Zahlen und die, wo wir gesehen haben, was eigentlich äh, sozusagen der Pfad ist, den wir gehen. Jetzt wir schaue auf die Bildschirme. Ähm, Ja, genau, Alter. Äh, ich sehe eine Frage aus dem, äh, aus dem Online Publikum. Ähm, äh, someone asking here about um, the Chinese coal fired power plants that you mentioned and um, it uh, it's asking about I think their um, run times or the age or when they were built. So I'm not sure what what this refers to. So you know, when were those uh, power plants built? What's the CO2 emissions like? And an additional question about the um, CCS uh, technologies, the uh, IPCC uh, report um, that you mentioned as, as well, that very much lays out that you know phasing out coal is important. Well, I mentioned that China has already phased out a lot of um, coal-fired power plants, a lot of recently built uh, power plants, in fact, that were just not very efficient. But there are a lot of other um, um, coal-fired uh, power plants that have also recently been built. So when we look at uh, meeting these targets, it's not just about moving towards green energy, it's also about phasing out old power plants. And um, a lot of that is due to steel production, of course. Um, and in China, the older power plants are relatively recent as well. And there was a massive uh, growth um, uh, at the uh, uh, early years um, of um, uh, the uh, new millennium. And when we look at um, uh, demand, uh, this historically follows uh, uh, the uh, per capita income, the global per capita income, and the income development in China as well. So that means that this is a huge challenge because it's recently built plants. And as I mentioned, uh, CCS is not that um, useful in this context, but I think they're still going to do it because they're not going to phase out and shut down all of these uh, plants and factories. In the IPCC scenarios, uh, we have different categories, um, one category being uh, CO2 uh, free or emissions free or low emissions, and that's uh, um, you know, parts of the plants um, that are coal-fired uh, with um, uh, CCS and whether that is financially and economically feasible and, and uh, uh, smart, that's a different question. Um, but as I've said, we should pretty much phase out all 
coal ultimately and I think um, using CCS there with these technologies is not going to play as much of a role. More so I think uh, in uh, the context of um, industrial production. Maybe you know different regions have different points of view and, and will use different um, technologies. But as I've mentioned, um, you know, there's a huge question about negative emissions, and these technologies are not really being implemented yet, not uh, really uh, along the entire uh, value chain yet. So we have to wait and see and get started on these negative emissions energies. That is going to take some time. And in, in Germany, we're looking at 2045, and that's not just um, you know, natural. Um, CO2 or carbon yeah. sinks, but uh, technological uh, carbon sinks as well. Well, the IPCC report also emphasized that when it comes to decarbonizing in the energy sector, um, then that there is um, a lot of inertia, really, in uh, the uh, regulatory framework and um, uh, still a lot of subsidies favoring uh, fossil fuels. So how would you tackle that, um, would you say, in, in order to get the, the greatest benefit for renewables? Well, I think, you know, at the IPCC, there are diff very different points of um, view there. There are the chair of um, that chapter was from the United States, uh, the co-chair from China, colleagues from France and uh, other regions. And you quickly realize that um, energy systems are very local and regional systems. So the question of what makes sense is a very regional or local question. So you look, have to look at the local context. For us, I think it's quite clear that if we want to move towards some um, climate neutrality, uh, zero emissions, then um, we, we have to expand on that and use a variety of uh, building blocks to do that. Um, we have to be faster in terms of approving these projects. We need more areas where we can build this on. We have to get people on board, so um, citizen participation is important and um, also have them participate in the uh, benefits of that. And you need the right framework. Um, you have to expand the grid, the energy grid. Uh, that is a huge issue right now, and it is only going to uh, become a, a bigger issue going forward. Uh, we have to expand that. There are a lot of initiatives um, that are looking at offshore as well, but you have to convey that. And the energy has to be transported somehow. So we need uh, these uh, uh, grids, and you have to tackle all of that. Because ultimately, these very ambitious uh, goals that we've set for expanding renewables, um, that means tripling or quadrupling um, uh, our uh, renewable energies, that does meet our climate targets. But in order to actually make that happen and implement that, we also have to work on all these individual uh, building blocks. Um, and I mean, of course, um, you know, economic feasibility and subsidies might be still a bit of a question, but we see that the trend here is is turning. That this um, really is it becomes clear that this is economically feasible as well to um, uh, expand renewables. And this is not going to happen from one day to to another. So you just have to make sure that is as as easy as possible to expand renewables. Thank you very much. This, of course, will be a very important topic today, expanding our networks. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lascher, for your very interesting contribution. Ja, und wir machen gleich weiter mit dem Thema zwischen Diversifizierung und Autarkie. Der Krieg in der Ukraine und seine Auswirkungen auf die Energiewende. This uh, became very clear over the last couple of months, and I am delighted to have uh, Mr. Jörg Zackmann here today, who is senior fellow in uh, Bruegel, a think tank, tank in Brussels. In Brussels, he worked uh, to establish a project on low carb in order to shape our energy transition. Dr. Zackmann, welcome. You have the floor. Thank you very much. Good morning. This year, for sure, will be included in history books. 
Everybody agrees on that. And the way in which we react to this current crisis will shape the future of the energy transition in Europe and also for the global energy transition, because we speak about long-term institutions, about trust between the partners, and we speak about the future of our energy markets in Europe, our joint institutions uh, that we have worked on over the last couple of decades are under great pressure. And if we won't be able to maintain these institutions, uh, then the energy transition will be extremely costly, if not completely impossible politically. This is why I would like to start my presentation by looking at uh, the margins of this crisis, of this war, um, by trying to explain how I see the crisis, how we should possibly react to this crisis, and which institutions we need in order to maintain this transition and to realize the transition. In fact, we not only have one energy crisis, but there are several energy crises uh, currently in Europe. On one hand, uh, the Russian gas supplies uh, have disappeared uh, and, uh, for, for Europe, and most probably we will have to completely renounced to Russian gas supply, not only due to our sanctions uh, towards Russia, but also due to Russian decisions. And we'll have to be, we have to be prepared for this. At the same time, uh, nuclear power stations uh, have stopped working in France. This also has had a huge impact on the European energy supply. We have underinvestments in Europe generally in um, the last decade in the energy sectors, which makes uh, that we lack uh, elasticity uh, here in Europe and flexibility to react. And on top of that, we have embargoes towards Russia for oil and oil products. And we have to see how this impacts the European crisis. In other words, we have an energy crisis uh, that has different sources, if you will. And uh, Germany and France have to uh, are also um, are playing an important role in this crisis. Since uh, I am from, from Brussels, you will not be surprised, but I hope you will agree when I say that the European market has so far really rescued us. Uh, if there was no European market, it would have been extremely difficult to uh, fill uh, German uh, gas tanks and uh, because uh, the countries would not have been transported uh, their gas supplies to Russia, so, uh, to, to Germany. And um, we have become an importer of uh, uh, fuels. It's very impressive how these systems have shifted and this is why we were able to prevent a complete, complete fallout of uh, electricity in spite of these changes. So volumes are more or less controlled at the moment. And because we found a market solution, it still has massive repercussions on the prices. It means what we see is that the prices have risen at two percent, uh, at around two percent in many European countries. And uh, this, of course, uh, had uh, repercussions on uh, the situations of uh, the uh, consumers in the uh, respective countries. But, uh, of course, uh, this is uh, very important, if not to say dangerous, politically. Therefore, I think that it is not, option, not, not an option to say we just let the markets work and uh, let uh, the countries come to terms with it. It has created and is creating social and economical problems. Um, this is slightly different for rich uh, member states, for Germany, for instance, but it just simply does not work for other countries who have not this uh, option 
of uh, fiscal calibration because they're not as well equipped and uh, Germany will not have uh, the option at the end of the day to uh, import energy. If, uh, for instance, and, and, and the same goes for uh, France, therefore Germany and France as the strongest countries have uh, the responsibility to provide for others in, in a way. So uh, we are quite uh, skeptical when it comes to a market interference. Uh, we already discussed that when speaking about the TTF cap. It's very problematic if you look at uh, the last couple of months and the way we were supplying ourselves with gas. If you look at this picture, we have 60% of BCM of Russian gas, and then we had to refill our tanks with 60 BCM. We had to find additional BCM, and we managed to do that because prices were so high. Therefore, demand has reclined by 40,000 cubic, uh, cubic, billion cubic meters. And, um, this was largely due to the high prices. The alternative suggestion, namely to say we set a cap to electricity prices, by subsidizing the gas uh, um, in the system is also very dangerous because, as I've already said, we have a limited amount of uh, um, uh, gas in Europe, we cannot uh, no longer import it because it's uh, getting more and more expensive. Therefore, the crisis that we have is in a way a gas crisis. So if we start subsidizing the gas in the electricity um, um, field, then electricity costs will decline. But our savings in electricity will be lost and um, we, would, we would effectively lose a full terminal. And then if we um, replace coal uh, uh, mines uh, through gas, then we will simply not be able to afford it because we will not have enough gas supplies. And it is a very radical mass uh, market intervention if you will. Therefore, we cannot uh, sit around idly and let the market work on its own. We also should not intervene in the market. So what should we do? We have um, to so, so, somehow help, because otherwise some countries will, fall, uh, will, will go away, like uh, Italy, for instance. Well. Uh, they could say, we, we have no sanctions towards Russia, therefore Russia can supply us with gas. And uh, this selective uh, gas supplies would create a, an incredible political problem for Europe. Therefore, what I would suggest is that we monitor the market and we keep the market and would try to create a market solution for uh, for us and at the same time organize transfer for transfers for those countries that we could help and that need our help. We have a responsibility as a strong, strongly positioned country to do so. We don't have to uh, supply transfers that are negative for us, but we could uh, try to find positive effects uh, for us, for our energy transition in this crisis. And I see three main elements. First is the idea of a joint industry support mechanism, which uh, prevents harmful subsidy races between the respective countries. That would be really damaging to us. The second point uh, would be to fund, to create a fund to incentivize energy savings. In Italy, for instance, uh, consumers are paid when they consume less, uh, less gas and uh, that, again, is gas that could be used in Germany, and if uh, you build photovoltaics um, in uh, Italy, then 
one photovoltaic uh, construction could uh, replace uh, one hour of uh, electricity or gas. So European solidarity could work really well here. And then um, the third point, it's uh, we have a discussion between would this be uh, a uh, an optional uh, decision or would be would this be a mandatory uh, decision and a European fund could uh, help us uh, purchasing uh, this and uh, companies would have a uh, voluntary option to to participate and these three solutions would be a great argument in order to maintain the European market and to overcome the crisis and start this new decade of decarbonization. If I still have a few minutes, I would like to also briefly speak about what we could do in the next decade. How do we reply uh, replace these uh, terawatt hours of Russian gas and uh, we could either produce more uh, energy in our own countries, more domestic energy. Uh, some, some European countries would use uh, nuclear power for this. Then we could try and reduce our energy demand. Uh, do we introduce uh, energy incentives, energy um, in incentive me measures, or the third solution would be we could try other to fi find other sources for our energy supplies, and this would all contribute to replacing Russian gas. But of course, this is a political task and also um, a task for our industry. The future of industry in which is what is very important uh, here, of course, in this ministry. And I must say I'm a bit worried when I look at the current structures. We're trying to maintain the current uh, structures that uh, exist. And uh, we try to introduce uh, subsidies Organisation von äh, von Importen eigentlich versucht die gegenwärtige Struktur so stark wie möglich zu erhalten. Das hat so ein bisschen das Gefühl einer Brücke, also dass man versucht eine Brücke. That already exists. So we're trying to build a bridge, if you will, into a future of our industry. But the question is, will this industry still exist in future? Because in my opinion, the costs for this industry, the costs for these uh, sectors will be too high so that competitivity will be very hard to maintain. And does it really make sense to build a bridge for this type of industry in future? The second alternative would be to try and maintain a structure with um, and, and, and try to roll, uh, to outsource uh, the energy intensive sectors and then the third idea would be to de-industrialize, and nobody really wants this. I would like to briefly speak about these two graphs. Uh, what could we roll out in terms of infrastructure, and then what do we have uh, for in terms of gas infrastructure? The question is, Will we really need the uh, fixed LNG terminals? Because the floating LNG terminals will have to be maintained. They're very attractive, but in terms of uh, fixed LNG terminals, uh, we'll have to talk about whether they really will be necessary in future. And what is also important are the forward gas prices. So when you look at this graph, you see that in 2026, there is a there will be a convergence between the EU and the US. However, the U.S. will still be price-wise, but will still cost half as much as uh, European uh, products because European products are just much more expensive than uh, American products. And how will this look in practice? Will we trade energy uh, between each other or will there be, for instance, energy intensive products like uh, Amoni that will be traded 
that is a different um, a different topic to discuss. I would also like to mention two points related to Ukraine. This current conflict and uh, the decisions, the political decisions that it entails, are also important for the future of energy transition. And as I've said, I'm a bit worried because Russia is still able to choose selective countries that it can supply with gas and oil, for instance. Italy, that of course has a very strong political signal and Russia will still be able to do this in future. So for us investors it will be difficult to understand and to estimate how can Russia still export uh, these amounts of gas per year. So we need a tool in a way in order to minimize the amounts of uh, Russian gas imported into Europe. So now that we are in this uh, conflict, we can do this much better than at different times. So the time is, is right. If we did this much later, that would have that would create uh, conflicts between the countries and would be much more complicated. And then my last point is we've all seen what happened to the Ukrainian uh, energy system, electricity system over the last couple of uh, weeks. This is pure terrorism in order to win over Ukraine and to cut Ukraine off. So what we can say to our companies, what you have, um, there, there is a whole list of what is needed for Ukraine, uh, uh, auto transformers and other equipment. We need people here in Europe who, who to call the companies and organize the logistics and do it very, very quickly. Because uh, Ukraine, if Ukraine stays without electricity for about two months, then this will be a huge humanitarian crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Zachmann, for this very interesting presentation and also for your suggestions that uh, for sure can entice the whole discussion. I would like to have a look and to the audience. I can see a hand raised. Please take the microphone and introduce yourselves and ask your questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. I would like to um, ask you if you if you speak of outsourcing, which countries do you have in mind? Which areas? That's a very good question <laughs> indeed. <laughs> What we have at the moment is that we have an energy intensive uh, industry in Europe that is subsidized. We, we provide them with certificates, we have the carbon border adjustments, they have indirect cost compensations and other exemptions. Uh, and probably uh, this all will be increased due to the crisis this year. And I personally think that we have to be very cautious with these measures and uh, be very selective. Because we work with a number of uh, companies uh, that have very little value added but are very energy intensive. And I think uh, these means would be better used otherwise. So the answer to your questions to your question is the global market should regulate this, should find uh, an intuitive response to this. So if we reduce uh, the support to acceptable levels and uh, we see this already in certain uh, sectors, then we will create a new system of uh, value-adding companies. So, of course, then other questions um, arise from that. Um, how, how does this restructure the industry? But I think, practically speaking, there's a number of products that can be very well outsourced because you can trade them really well. And 
Therefore, I think uh, that uh, market forces can play that out. We have subsidized certain industrial clusters for many, many years, and I think that uh, we can do better, and it uh, has really created um, companies that should not be. Certain companies should not uh, should receive less uh, support. I, I see another hand raised. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Zachmann, for this uh, very interesting presentation. Ganz entscheidend. This uh, last uh, slide that you had, this is very decisive. I think uh, all of Europe needs to work and make sure that we stabilize the Euro Ukrainian electricity networks, supply uh, parts uh, that are needed as soon as possible and uh, deliver them as soon as possible. We are currently working on that, but we cannot stress this enough. Another question to hydrogen. You didn't really mention this, but uh, I agree with you that we uh, will see changes because, because green Omni will, um, will change. We will import green Omni in future. If um, we, when we look at import costs for hydrogen plants, uh, then we will pay 90 euros, uh, about 90 euros for, uh, per hour. Teilweise bis 40 runtergehen bei der Arena. Das wird die Energiemärkte massiv verändern. And I think that this will change the energy market. Who will buy uh, gas for 100 uh, gas for 100 euros per hour if I can buy gas for 60 euros per hour? What is your position on this? How do you see it? Thank you very much for mentioning this. I really did not speak about uh, the subject of the, the topic of hydrogen. It is true that different modules create different prices, different costs. And if you look at uh, prices for it, uh, we have a studies from February with the European Parliament uh, discussing a a hydrogen input strategy versus electricity only strategy. And uh, we've seen the different scenarios create different price categories. So it's, it's a bit difficult to give you a very concrete answer to this, a concrete solution. But I do think that innovation and investments uh, will allow us to test it, that, that this is the right path. We should try it out to a certain extent. But I think we also have other low-hanging fruits. You mentioned uh, MENA, the MENA region, um, and because uh, Europe is also very diverse in nature. So, if I think about uh, Sardinia or Extremadura, for instance, uh, that they can use uh, direct electrification for industry production, then it's a completely different question. And then we should ask ourselves, well, Germany, for instance, used a lot of coal energy in the 19th century and uh, has maintained it for a long time. But now, energy no longer is powered by coal, but uh, happens in North Germany and in the south of Europe. So, to which extent do we want to maintain it and keep it up via energy pipelines? Uh, 
And to what extent can we use products that are generated and uh, produced in other regions of Europe um weiterhin unsere Industriestandorte mit diesen Vorprodukten zu versorgen. Also diese, diese Vorstellung, wir müssen jetzt die Terawattstunde Kohle, die wir dann durch eine Terawattstunde Hydrogen. So I am a bit skeptical that this is the right path in the long term. Thank you very much. We have time for just one brief question from the audio from uh, um, that is asked online. Uh, I also have to consider online audience. Electrification means new dependencies. Um, because we will have to use new commodities. What new problems do arise from this? Now, I think problems uh, with this are much, much smaller than we look at fossil fuels, because fossil fuels uh, create a flow of um, commodities that were just uh, burned with, uh, with renewable ed energies and new options we create. Uh, we have less waste and we have more countries that can participate. So um, I would be very cautious to uh, see it uh, globally and to superficially uh, speak about uh, these uh, problems. But maybe I'm not expert enough and not uh, experienced enough in this field. But if we speak about autarky versus diversification, my dream idea would be that when creating these uh, trade agreements, that we will try to avoid monopolization. So if, for instance, I import 50% of my gas from Russia, then the 51st percent will be so expensive that it's, not, it's no longer worth to import it from Russia that I will uh, look at other regions uh, for my imports uh, and uh, therefore the market would still work but we will have an instrument that will prevent us and save us from a certain dependency on specific countries. Thank you very much. Um, I have to ask you for your understanding that I am not able to ask everyone and, and give everybody the opportunity to ask a question. We'll have to talk about many things during the coffee break. Thank you very much. And um, our last uh, speaker um, for this uh, morning before we head to the coffee break is the World Energy Outlook 2022 Global State of Affairs and Perspective for Europe's uh, Decarbonization, uh, going to be presented by Laura Kotzi, who is Chief Energy Modeler at the uh, IEA, the International Energy Agency. And she's responsible for this um, World Energy Outlook, and she's uh, had um, some experience um, working at um, ENI, um, the uh, energy uh, company Antem. There is uh, Laura Kotze. The floor is yours. Good morning and a uh, great pleasure to be with uh, all of you, even if uh, virtually today. And uh, I've uh, uh, listened with uh, great interest the presentations already up to now. What I will try to do is to uh, give a bit of a um, more global context um, as uh, Europe remains uh, uh, incredibly interconnected with, uh, uh, with the rest of the world uh, uh, for what concerns energy, energy trade, and of course, anything that concerns uh, climate change. So let me uh, maybe start with uh, uh, try to give you the first uh, and most important questions our executive director, Dr. Girol, asked us to answer when we were putting together this uh, uh, World Energy Outlook. Is this crisis going to slow down or accelerate the global uh, clean energy transition? And we can go to the first slide. So in our assessment, um, uh, as you can see here, over the past several years, since the Paris Agreement, the uh, landmark Paris Agreement was signed in 2015, we didn't see a huge 
increase in clean energy investment. They were around 1 trillion uh, US dollars for the past several years, with a first increase that was seen in 2021, really mainly thanks uh, to uh, European policies that started bumping up through sustainable recoveries, the beginning of the Green Deal starting bumping up the global total in terms of clean energy. But our expectations now uh, in the way to 2030 is really a very significant increase. For the first time, uh, topping 2 trillion US dollars investment in renewables, uh, electric vehicles, uh, clean hydrogen, we just heard about it, uh, would see a very, very significant uh, growth. Um, why is that happening? Certainly, we are seeing uh, increased momentum in terms of structural changes uh, in Europe, with uh, uh, support coming from uh, European governments, uh, from the Commission itself. But it's not only Europe. Uh, the America, the United States, Canada, but the United States in particular, just passed uh, an incredibly important Inflation Reduction Act uh, that puts on the table 390 billion US dollars, making solar and wind the cheapest form by far of electricity generation uh, in the US, uh, providing some uh, additional gas for exports, uh, 30 BCM by 2030, that could see the route towards Europe, but at the same time really do kickstart a very significant increase, not only in renewables, in the domestic EV sector, uh, and uh, uh, also on hydrogen and CCS. If we go to Asia, we are seeing similar things in Japan, Green Transformation Plan, which puts big accent on, on, uh, on restarting nuclear, but at the same time, uh, also a huge investment uh, in hydrogen. Um, and while we hear a lot of discussions about building new coal-fired power plants in China and India, what we are also seeing on the ground really is record level of investments uh, in renewables happening in those two countries. So all in all for us, we are going to expect a very significant, unprecedented, 30% higher than we were expecting last year uh, in terms of uh, uh, global clean energy investment. Is that enough to be on track with 1.5 degrees? The answer is no. but is still a significant improvement compared to last year. Which is the sector that is uh, moving ahead the uh, furthest and fa fastest, uh, if we can go to the next slide, is really the electricity sector. Uh, what, you can, uh, what you can see here actually is that for this year, we are expecting uh, an increase in coal in Europe, in Asia, a modest increase in coal, at the same time as we see this modest increase in, in coal, we should underline that the incremental generation that is coming from wind, incremental generation that is coming from solar this year alone will be larger the increase that we are seeing in coal. So this blip that we are seeing in coal is for us temporary. By 2025 already, we are going to be seeing coal on a structural decline and to 2030, which is what you see here, even further with two clear winners there, solar and wind, taking up a larger share of electricity generation. Within five years, we are expecting solar global capacity to overtake that of coal globally, a first in terms of uh, what we would be expecting in terms of, I would say, energy history, but also in, in general industrialization history. Who is moving uh, uh, quicker? You can see this on the uh, right-hand side of the slide, is clearly advanced economies, uh, re really nose diving power sector emissions, but it's also important to underline that the expectation of rollout of solar, wind and other renewables is also keeping in check the emissions from advanced and emerging economies. All in all, this for us means that probably this year or the next, we'll be living through the peak in uh, electricity sector emissions, which is by itself uh, um, uh, something uh, that we will celebrate when we understand in a few years' time that the peak is really uh, behind us. The key question is, with a lot of uncertainty that we are living in, um, what is uh, the industry doing on the ground, and in particular in clean energy technologies? Uh, what we have done, if we can go to the next slide, is uh, really tracking across uh, a number of clean energy technologies what is currently installed 
and all the plans that uh, industry are expecting to be making towards the, in, over the next few years. And we have uh, actually um, checked that level against what we would need if we were fully on track with a um, 1.5 degree scenario. What you can see here is, for example, solar, the plants around, announced around the world would be by itself enough to produce enough solar capacity um, for the world to be on track with the 1.5 degree scenario. Similarly, uh, we are seeing uh, uh, deployment uh, and construction of new uh, batteries factories for mostly uh, electric vehicle, uh, expanding very, very rapidly and also uh, nearing the level needed in a 1.5 degree scenario. We have spoken about uh, hydrogen um, and in particular electrolyzers. Um, Georg, Georg mentioned that uh, and in the conversation afterwards was also mentioned. What we are seeing is really unprecedented in the hydrogen space, uh, in particular on, on electrolyzers. Even if what you see in this chart, only 4% of those projects have concluded today FIDs, we're seeing an incredible amount of interest throughout, um, throughout the world. So uh, for us, what we are experiencing on the ground is that actually most of the industrial players in the clean energy space are moving even quicker than what the stated policies, what governments have put in place. They are ready to invest more. Clearly not all of those uh, will see uh, FID will not see the uh, the light of the day. However, I have to say that this does not include the push that we are expecting to see from the Inflation Reduction Act and what we hear, for example, in terms of extra push that may come next year in India through the G20 and other type of uh, uh, of international international pushes. If we can go to the next slide, one area um, where we are expecting a major shift, the next slide please, um, is uh, uh, the future of natural gas. Uh, this will not come uh, as a surprise, but uh, we have been seeing over the past decade uh, natural gas globally increasing very strongly. We have been calling that at the International Energy Agency a golden age of gas. Well, going forward, this, this decade is going to look very different. Globally, our expectation is that demand will only grow uh, 5%. And this will change uh, very dramatically the dynamics uh, for natural gas uh, um, trade and natural gas uh, investment. Why are we having such a very different expectation in terms of uh, natural gas demand this decade? We are seeing, first of all, in advanced economies, in, the, in Europe, in uh, the United States, but increasingly in Asia as well, um, the push for renewables, nuclear and other alternatives to really dry up the demand for natural gas in the power sector. And this is causing uh, this part of natural gas demand uh, in advanced economies to actually peak and decline uh, very significantly. Uh, at the same time, what we are observing on the ground in emerging economies is that currently investment in new gas fire power plants is considered extremely, extremely expensive. It is extremely expensive and it is dangerous. So this is changing the outlook for natural gas materially and is also changing significantly the expectation in terms of trade. So what you see in the right hand side of this, of this, uh, of this slide is not demand, is how trade will evolve. One first difference to underline is clearly that while demand grows less, uh, demand for LNG increases significantly. Clearly, part of it going uh, to Europe, the substitute uh, um, uh, Russian uh, pipeline gas, but at the same time, an increasing demand for LNG trade in Asia. And over the next couple of years, tension clearly among vessels going to one or uh, the other market. Something to underline in this slide as well is that uh, um, we discuss very often um, the fact that uh, uh, if Russia, the moment Russia has lost the European market, 
uh, can Russia actually find equally large uh, consumers in Asia? And our assessment shows very clearly that uh, partly uh, there will be new and increasing flows of Russian gas toward China through pipeline, but they will not be able to uh, completely compensate. It's going to be only a fraction of gas that was flowing to Europe. For us, this has very significant implication uh, for uh, Russian role in global energy trade. We are expecting Russian role in global energy trade to actually half from now to 2030 for a combination of sanctions. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, they will not be able to uh, make uh, strategic investments, for example, in new LNG, as uh, they do not have a uh, commercially competitive LNG domestically uh, developed uh, technology and clearly uh, deterioration and cuts with the major uh, uh, importer uh, Europe. So all in all, uh, we are seeing a dichotomy of record high level of revenues for this year, but overall from now to 2030, an overall loss of energy-related uh, uh, imports revenues towards Russia of over 1 trillion US dollars with very significant implications for the Russian economy going forward. What does all this mean uh, for Europe? Next slide, please. Uh, Georg and the previous speaker spoke about this at length, in particular for what it means uh, for France and Germany. What is our assessment? If we want to, um, as we have the intention through the Repower EU, get out of Russian gas, uh, there are a combination of things that need to happen. It's very clear that the supply alone or demand alone uh, will, not, uh, will not make it. It's only a combination of the two that has to be very carefully calibrated, can really let us uh, out of uh, Russian gas within the fully within the next seven to eight years and it let us out in a sustainable, um, uh, economically affordable uh, manner. Uh, our assessment is on the demand side that clearly a big push uh, of uh, solar and wind uh, is, is critical, but at the same time it's not going to be enough. You all know that uh, heating uh, is uh, uh, actually the largest consumer of gas in Europe, so immediately thinking through a heating strategy that uh, uh, as a combination of buildings efficiency and a significant rollout of heat pumps uh, is what will take Europe on track for having all what's needed in the structural demand measures. I'm not talking here about behavior changes through which we can live for a couple of years of uh, lowering thermostats uh, and, uh, and other type of behavior, of behavior measures. At the same time, we need to work on supply. We have seen incredible efforts done through, throughout Europe in terms of supplying new LNG, replenishing storage at the excellent level at the beginning of this year, this has to be sustained and continued uh, through natural gas, but also as we move towards at the end of the decade, looking at alternatives, uh, in particular hydrogen and bioenergy. If we go to the uh, next slide, please, um, what we are seeing is really uh, where we are today in terms of the three critical pillars here, uh, low carbon electricity in the power sector, electric cars, uh, and I'll come to this in a second, and, and hydrogen, um, what we are seeing is still a gap between what governments at national level have announced and where we would be if we wanted to fully meet the Repower EU. For solar and wind, uh, certainly for us here, um, cutting the red tape and accelerating um, the, uh, the permitting time is absolutely critical. Germany has done an excellent job here. It's not the case for all European countries. That should be number one priority. We need to speed up uh, the rollout of, uh, of uh, electric vehicles even more as uh, uh, the, uh, the oil uh, uh, embargo comes into force fully uh, within a couple of weeks uh, of weeks' time. Uh, there is really a need to free up oil through the refining sector to supply diesel as much as possible, and EVs are one of the necessary elements uh, in the structural change here. Uh, the biggest gap that we're seeing in terms of uh, where we would need to be 
uh, if you wanted to fully follow uh, Fit for 55 uh, and, and, and the Repower EU ambition is really industrial uh, low emission hydrogen uh, with a lot of interest uh, coming up um, and uh, really uh, having a concerted uh, work to ensure that those projects actually do see the light of the day. Uh, uh, next slide, please. In terms of emissions, uh, this, uh, uh, of course, takes us uh, uh, on a continuing uh, um, declining trajectory, uh, although not yet fully aligned with uh, 1.5 degrees. I would say that just coming out of COP, um, two uh, observations, a uh, lot of discussion about loss and damage. I would think, and here again, uh, very much uh, France and Germany together with the, the US and Japan leading on the Just Energy Transition Partnership for Indonesia is probably one of the key achievements that was not very much discussed or celebrated that is really moving the needle globally towards uh, 1.5 degrees. In our latest assessment, if all announced pledges were to be followed, what we have on the table today would lead us to global temperature to be limited to 1.7 degrees. Let me finish with the next slide, which looks uh, in particular at Europe and the next winter. I would like you to just focus on uh, the red gap uh, here in the middle of, uh, of these slides. Um, I think what Europe has done, all the member countries have done, is really incredible efforts to fill up the storage. We have been lucky with the weather in October and up to uh, last week uh, with a rather mild winter, uh, if uh, uh, things go in the right direction, uh, we uh, may be lucky enough to go through uh, March, April this year and beginning on 2023 with having enough, uh, enough gas, with most of the focus being concentrated really on the affordability side and not the security of supply side of the story. However, if we look at the, the supply demand gap, for next winter, for 2023, as we will have depleted storage of gas in a much more significant way that we have done, that we had at the beginning of, of this uh, winter, if we don't accelerate action further, our assessment is that we will have a 30 BCM uh, gap to fill. And we are working already as of now with the Commission, with the Member States, uh, to make sure that this 30 BCM gap is filled as quickly as possible. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, vielen Dank, uh, Frau Kott. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Kotzi. Thank you so much for these exciting uh, facts and figures. And let's see if we have questions. Any questions from our audience? There's one question at the back and now, if you could introduce yourself um, uh, back there and a short answer, please, Ms. Kotzi. Well, what, what language um, should we do? We'll do German. So one uh, question for you, Ms. Kotzi, in your report and your outlook, did you also uh, assume a reduction, a strong reduction of energy demand or energy needs. So prior to your presentation, we've heard that it's uh, important for us to reduce demand, to lose yes, less energy. But um, I didn't really see that in, in your presentation. Um, I mean, there was flat demand in, in gas, I think, um, but it, I didn't really see a reduction. So. Could you tell us a bit about that? Um, have you calculated that as well? What what would happen if we reduce uh, our energy demand? Thank you. I couldn't really uh, fully understand um, uh, the question. The sound was not great. If I understood correctly, it was about uh, energy de demand reduction for Europe. Uh, in fact, yes, we do see uh, energy demand uh, uh, playing a huge role, uh, for, especially for gas. Uh, we are expecting that actually half, uh, so around 80 BCM of uh, uh, the overall 150 that we were 
uh, importing pre-Russia uh, invasion of Ukraine would actually come from uh, reduction in, uh, in, energy, in energy use. It's a combination of uh, efficiency measures that would completely cut uh, energy use or uh, switching to the alternatives, uh, take the example of uh, heat pumps, uh, or uh, simply moving towards renewable energy that cut gas uh, gas, gas use vis-a-vis -vis, uh, vis -vis, uh, using, uh, using the alternative. So, um, if I understood uh, correctly, the, the question is whether energy demand reduction plays a role, and the answer is uh, absolutely yes. In the shorter term, I have to add that uh, we had put forward several 10-point uh, plans of what uh, we could be doing, playing my part also in terms of consumers, and behaviour change were uh, considered absolutely critical especially for this winter, the coming winter, and the next two, two to three years. Having said this, we do believe the structural measures uh, are absolutely paramount and more important in the medium to long term. Thank you, Ms. Kotzi. Thank you very much um, for your question. Uh, now we have our coffee break coming up and um, you're, of course, invited to continue uh, your discussions. And at um, half past 11, at 11.30, uh, I would like uh, to ask you to be back here uh, and we'll continue at 11.30. Thank you, thank you. I hope it worked all right. Thank you.